it's good to get out here away from your normal normal responsibilities. Your normal interaction with other people. To give the mind a chance to look after itself. This is the basic principle in the practice, is that you really do have to look after yourself. And John Sawat used to comment, there's a teaching that makes the round sometimes that the whole purpose of the practice is to learn to be selfless. But he says, that's not true. You have to take good care of yourself, but you have to do it in a wise way. In psychology, they, talk, they call this having a healthy ego, realizing that you have outside responsibilities, but also you have inner needs. And the wise person is one who knows how to balance them. So on the one hand, your inner needs and inner desires don't take over totally, with no regard for society. And on the other hand, that outside strictures don't take over totally either. One of those strictures is the idea that when you practice meditation, you shouldn't have any idea of gaining anything out of it. It's all for the good of all beings, it's all for the good of the world, but you somehow shouldn't get anything out of it yourself. That doesn't last long. Everything the Buddha taught balances two needs. One is to find your own happiness, and two is not to harm the happiness of others, and to provide whatever happiness you can for them. That's commensurate with your own happiness. And you can see the practice as a way of developing the skill of learning how to balance the two. The image the Buddha gives is of two acrobats. The acrobat gets on the top of a bamboo pole, and his assist assistant gets up on his shoulders, and he tells her, "Okay, now." You look out after me, and I'll look out after you, and that way we'll perform our tricks safely and come down from the pole." And she said, No, I have to look after myself, and you look after yourself. That way we perform our tricks safely and come down from the pole. In other words, she said she had to look after her own sense of balance, and he had to look after his. And if each person was maintaining his or her sense of balance, everybody benefits. So everything from the practice of generosity on up to the practice of meditation is done because it benefits you and it benefits other people. When you're generous, the obvious beneficiary, of course, is the other person who receives your gift. But you also develop good qualities of mind, the qualities that enable you to continue with the practice as a whole, because the attitude of giving underlies everything else. The precepts are said to be a gift. Even your meditation is a gift. If you can train your mind so it's less greed, anger, and delusion, you're not the only person who benefits. The people around you benefit as well. And as for the gift of virtue, the Buddha said it's once you make up your mind that you're not going to kill anybody or steal anything or have illicit sex with anybody at all, and you make this a continuous practice, with no exceptions. You're giving the gift, he says, of unlimited security to other beings. And when you give them unlimited security, you have a share in that security as well. So these are, these are practices that benefit everybody. Even the qualities that we associate with the Buddha his wisdom, his compassion, and his purity come from the need to learn how to balance your well-being with the well-being of other people. Wisdom, he said, comes from the question, what, when I do it, will be for my long-term welfare and happiness? In other words, recognizing that your actions are going to be crucial in happiness and that you want a long-term happiness rather than just a short-term blip. 
becomes for a bit and then turns into something else and runs away. Once you start thinking in those terms, you say, that's the beginning of wisdom, and it's also the beginning of a healthy ego, realizing you just can't give in to every immediate desire. You've got to balance it with the consideration that something is long-term. This also fits in with the, the Buddhist definition of a wise person is someone who knows what's his or her own duties and what are the duties of other people. If you're wise, you do your duties and you leave other people's duties alone. It gives you a very clear sense of where the boundaries are. But even with those boundaries, you want to help the other person where it's commensurate with your duty. This moves into the second quality, which is compassion. There's a great story in the canon where King Vasanity is in his inner chamber with one of his favorite queens. And he asks her, is there anyone you love more than yourself? That's quite a come-on line. And he, of course he expects her to say, yes, Your Majesty, I love you more than I love myself, and then who knows where it's going to go from there. But she says, no. How about you? Is there anybody you love more than yourself? And he had to admit frankly that no, there wasn't. So then the king after that went down to see the Buddha and reported the conversation. And the Buddha said, you search the world and you never find anybody that you really love more than yourself. But he says that doesn't mean you just look after your own self. When you think about this, you realize everybody else loves themselves too. And so you should never do anything to harm them. After all, if they want happiness and your happiness depends on their misery, they're going to do something to get rid of your happiness. And the more you get used to taking their point of view in mind, the more compassion becomes not a calculating approach, but one that we really do have a sense of fellow feeling. And then finally, purity, the third of the Buddha's great virtues. And that comes from, he said, looking at your actions before you do them, while you're doing them, and after they're done, to see if you anticipate any harm, if you are doing any harm, or if you have done any harm, either to yourself or to other people. And if you see that you have, you make up your mind you're not going to repeat that mistake. If you see that you haven't, you take joy and continue on the path. So wisdom, compassion, and purity come from what psychologists call basically healthy ego functioning. The ability to balance your needs against the needs of other people, and to balance your short-term desires for happiness, your desires for immediate happiness, with the knowledge that some kinds of happiness require time, especially if they're really reliable. And they're going to be long-term. You have to put a long-term practice in. You have to be willing to defer gratification. All these things require a good, strong, healthy sense of self. Knowing what's your duty, what's not your duty, and which of your impulses you can give in to and which ones you can't, which demands from outside you should give in to and which ones you can't. Ideally balancing everything so that everybody benefits. Even the teaching on not-self is a part of good ego functioning, because you realize after all that this assumption you've been making about yourself that's helped you along, doesn't apply in all cases. There are subtler and more lasting forms of happiness that, that can't be attained if you hold on to a sense of who you are. So instead of looking at things in terms of who you are, you look at them simply in terms of cause and effect. Because that ultimately is the, the true basis of healthy functioning in the world. So you learn how to disidentify with things, to look at things purely in terms of cause and effect, which is what we're practicing here right now. We look at the breath. Where is the breath comfortable? Where is it not? What can you do to make it more comfortable? This is a form of happiness that doesn't harm anybody else at all. You're already breathing. It's simply a matter of learning how to breathe more skillfully. 
And it's something very intimate. The breath is the closest thing you have, which means you can take it with you everywhere you go, and it's always right there inside, as long as you learn how to keep your awareness right here inside. You can be in touch with the breath at all times. So the question is how to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out, and how to calm any tense waves of breathing so you can give rise to feelings of rapture and pleasure whenever you want them, totally without any cost to anybody else. This meditation is a good example of healthy ego functioning. You do want something out of it. Sometimes they tell you that you should meditate without any sense of gaining anything. That's when you have a very short time to meditate and you really have the tendency to set impossible goals for yourself. In cases like that, it is wise to put the idea of goals aside say, just be here in the present moment, don't think about where it's going. But when you take on meditation as a daily habit, You've got to have a good sense that you know, this will lead someplace. This is a useful practice, because it requires making time in the midst of whatever busy schedule you've got. You have to have a strong sense of the good that can come from practicing meditation, both for yourself and for people around you. So learn how to meditate with that balanced attitude. The Buddha is not telling you to have no ego. He's telling you, showing you the way to have a healthy ego. And then the healthy ego gets really developed. And an ego is not a thing. It's not a being inside you. It's a type of functioning. It's the way the mind functions, negotiating between different demands and different principles. But negotiating in a wise way, a way that really is beneficial to yourself and to the people around you. that the meditation really is a gift to yourself and to the people around you. Your whole practice is a gift. As John Mahabhu once said, the whole practice from the very beginning, the very just basic generosity all the way to the noble attainments, is simply the same principle applied with more and more refinement. It's all of peace. As Lama Budun said, the, the Dharma is one thing clear through. A happiness that's totally harmless. It's something that spreads the benefits around. So they're not just for you, they're for all the people who come into contact with you. <laughs>